singing that song, I just heard the Lord say she's prophesying. Yes, sir. She's prophesying. She's speaking into her situation. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. That's why it gripped you and, yes. and moved you like it did. Rob had that guitar prophesying. Yes. So I appreciate that too. So I, I'm a fan. As you have, I have, uh, I'm just a fan of the, of what God is doing prophetically in this hour. And, uh, you know, when I say that, it's probably a little different than most of what you hear outside in different places about what's prophetic. I just believe God's got something to say, and he's got something to say really clearly. And I believe he's drawing us to himself for, a, for such a time as this. So uh, I want to uh, I want to say, you know, I've complimented Ruth and Kathy and, and Gary on how nice the place looks, and it looks just it looks really great. So. This time last year, we were just sweating the details and painting the wall black, right? It looks pretty sharp anyway, though. Praise the Lord. Uh, anyway, that being said, we were, uh, we're just grateful for what the Lord is doing and for where we are. And, and uh, you know, I, I know that this uh, season and this uh this particular year has uh, has been, not been an easy thing to uh, to navigate for a lot of people, um, and I, I certainly am don't want to present anything in a way that would diminish the struggle and the difficulty that some people have had. That being said, God's still God. Yes. God's still good. Yes. He is still. Uh, he is still uh, worthy of praise. He is still worthy of honor. And so we will, uh, we are, we're going to step into some stuff this morning. I'm going to, last week we uh, uh, preached some things on, uh, I'm not sure what we preached on last week right off the top of my head. But we preached some things. How long we just, <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. I preached on blind Bartimaeus. Yes, the Lord, yes. the Lord helps me when I get lost like yes. this. So, uh, and uh, so I, I, there was some things in there that uh, I had never seen before that the Lord brought out, and so that's part of that prophetic element that uh, that I appreciate. But uh, after the service last week, uh, for those of you who were here and got to see my oh, my oldest son was here last week with his family and and his. Uh, and his squeeze. So, Jamie, if you're listening, we love you, darling. And uh, they have announced this week that they're going to uh, they're going to uh, tie the knot. And so we are. Uh, we didn't know that at the time last week. We weren't aware that was something that's been working. It's hasn't been in the forefront of our activity. Uh, but by the same token, we are we're grateful and thankful 
one of the things that I said to them afterwards was I, I just really loved what the, the, the peace and the joy that I saw in them together. And, but I, but I felt like I had to say some things to, to him that I think he needed to hear. And as I said them to him, the Holy Spirit throughout the week kept, continued to drop this phrase in my spirit and said, this is for more than just your son. These are for all of my children. And I stood up here and he began to weep and after everything was over and I said to him, these were, this was my phrase to him, and so I apologize to him in advance for making this public, but this is, this is something that I feel like God, God opened me to through him, and now there's something more to it that we need to, uh, that we need to look at. But I looked at him and I said, you have been broken, but you are not broken. really just hit me and he began to weep and I, I began to I, we just we stood up here and we just have felt the, the the work of the Holy Spirit and this week as I you know spent some time in the rain and in the woods and all that neat stuff and and uh, I did get I did see something brown and did put it down so I did get that done this week uh, no horns but we did it it's a good thing the UPS man didn't show up right <laughs> just kidding just playing around for for clarity there, okay. Uh, anyway, but as I was sitting out and thinking, and uh, and uh, I had Tuesday morning, I sat in. I have a ground blind that I made with bales of hay and for rolls of hay. And I was sitting there, and as I sat there, and I was watching the field and watching the woods and trying to watch about three or four different possible uh, approaches and avenues. I looked out and I saw this bird flying over the river and I thought man that's a that's a good sized buzzard out here and so then I so I pulled my range finder up and looked at it and I thought I saw the brown body and the white head and the yellow beak and I said oh that's no that's no buzzard that's old baldy that's a bald eagle flying there uh, close to the house and so I We've seen him before, multiple occasions, uh, and uh, but I, I just I saw I texted, pulled my phone out, which was on silent, texted Jackie and said, "I see the eagle," and you know so. But as I sat there and I watched that eagle soar, the Holy Spirit started speaking to me and saying, "What you said to your son, what you said to Jared, speaks to many lives and speaks into many lives." And so, for those of you here today who have been broken. Yes, hallelujah. Those of us here in this room, and this is, speaks volumes to me because I've been broken. Yes, yes. And perhaps you've been broken. If you're young enough and you haven't understood that you've been broken, you will probably be broken at some point. But understand that you do not stay broken. No. Understand that that does not define you. Understand that everything that you have tread through, walked through, whether it's fire or flood, whether it is wilderness or desert, whether it is, uh, whether it is pain or, uh, or any kind of obstacle and circumstance that you do not understand, can I tell you that you are not broken. Yes. You may have been broken. Life will grab you by the collar sometimes and punch you in the gut to where you can't breathe. But I want to tell you something. You will breathe again. God will breathe into your life. And he will breathe life into your lungs. And you will meet the Lord in the very air that you breathe. And so I, I say to you this morning. That you may have been broken. But you are not broken. No. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. Psalm 34 and 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. Yes. Psalm 147 says, He heals the broken in heart and binds up their wounds. So God does not leave us broken. If He taught us anything about the, the man who was broken on the Jericho Road, 
It's that ministries might fail you. Priests might pass you by. People that you have an expectation toward may fail you at some point, And you will suffer more than you think you deserve. But can I tell you that there is one who will not pass you by. There is one who will, who will be moved with compassion and pour oil and wine into your wound, into your brokenness. And if you still cannot move, he will set you on his beast. He will take you to a place where he can put you in a place to convalesce. Yes, amen. Amen. Praise God. Pay the tab in the process. Because oh. God's got you covered. Yes, he does. I love that story. The reason why I love it is because being a Samaritan was not complimentary in first century Israel, right? No. They were considered... Uh, they were considered mixed and, and, and uh, of an impure uh, style of Judaism. And so they were, they, were, they were viewed really with more contempt in many ways than the, than the heathen, than those who were completely in the, uh, an outsider. Because they, they held them in even greater contempt, if you will. And so one of, the, one of the things that the Pharisees said about Christ was, Say we not well of you. That you're a Samaritan and has the devil. See, they were so angry at him. They were so vexed at him. They were so put off by his by his approach, by his by not just the things that he taught, but uh, but the way that he lived his teaching, the way that he presented God to his generation that would change forever human perspective and the human uh, 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 view of who God is and how God operates. And so they wanted to they wanted to really put him down and they said, say we not well of you that you're a Samaritan and has the devil. I believe that's why Jesus taught the parable. The man who was overcome on the road to Jericho, the man who the, 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 the priest walked by him, the Levite crossed the road to get away from him and went by him and, and they were, you know, they, they were, they, they felt sorry for him perhaps, but they had things to do and if they touched him, they would be unclean. But that's why Jesus didn't say, we call it the good Samaritan, but Jesus doesn't call him a good Samaritan, he calls him a certain Samaritan. So I think he's talking about the certain Samaritan that they just tried to label him as. I think what he's saying is, is, you know, you guys have called me a Samaritan. Let me tell you that. Let me tell you a story about a certain Samaritan. What he's going to do is he's going to find you broken. He's going to find you bleeding. He's going to find you tore up. He's going to find you betrayed. He's going to find you well, that, that you've been ignored and overlooked and you've been shunned even when you couldn't help yourself. There's a certain Samaritan that's got it in his heart to fix what's wrong with you. There's a certain Samaritan that has you in the depths and the bosom of his faith that he will carry you Hallelujah. to a place of healing, to a place of restoration, to a place of redemption. Yes, he will. Glory. I have to get warmed up. <laughs> Isaiah 61 speaks of Messiah. Jesus quotes it in John, or excuse me, in Luke 4, in his first message in his hometown, right? I'm not necessarily going to turn there, but I just want to, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And to do what? To bind up the brokenhearted. To preach uh, liberty to the captives, to proclaim, uh, to proclaim the good news to the poor, right? He's, he is this, this grand redeemer, this this kinsman that is able to uh, affect our lives in a, in a dimension that allows us to heal, to recover, to be restored. And so it's important, I think. I want to go to 1 Kings. Let's go. I only got one text today, but it's from verse 17, verse 41. So 1 Kings 18. And verse 17, I'm going to pick this up. I'm going to give you just uh, try to limit my background as best I can as far as preaching goes. And uh, It's okay if you just mumble good luck with that. I'm good with that. I am a, I believe.
testimony, context and background is so important. But I was titling this, this, uh, uh, repairing the broken. And I may have, I may, maybe rebuilding the broken might be a better, a better term, but I'm going to go stick with what I started with there, repairing the broken. Because I'm going to give you the scenario. The scenario is, is that Israel has lost its way. Israel is governed by a king named Ahab and a queen named Jezebel. And I'm not going to get into all the particulars of the things that they did. Just know that he was, he was for a long time the most, uh, uh, I want to say he had the worst reputation of all the kings for, for several generations until Manasseh came along. And then, then that guy would did, would did evil like nobody's business, right? Anyway, Elijah is in full prophetic mode and prophetic gear. And he is so, he is so forward in his approach. Elijah is a tough cookie. Yeah. He's one of them, he's one of them prophets that's hide hair and everything. If it comes, it just, it just happens, right? He's one of those guys that, uh, that, that, will, that he's going to lay it out there and you're just going to have to deal with the presentation. And even if, uh, even if it's not exactly your cup of tea, you're just going to have to appreciate. You're going to have to deal with the presentation to handle the word of the Lord when it comes from Elijah. Anyway, the system or the, uh, uh, let me rephrase that, the government that he is, uh, that, that is, positioned against him, if you will, is a government that has slain prophets of the Lord. And what I mean by that is, is that they have actually put to death the prophets of the Lord because that's one of the things that in early in my, uh, in, in my Christian life, when I looked at some of this stuff and I thought, this is really bad. He goes and he's going to kill all these prophets of Baal. I don't know about that. But what set the stage was these folks were feeding at Jezebel's table, and Jezebel had already killed the prophets of Israel. She'd already killed multitudes of prophets. Only a man named Obadiah had hid a hundred prophets, 50 in one cave and 50 in another, and fed them bread and water. He was able to keep them and save them alive. And so it was Obadiah that had the reputation for trying to hold on to what God was saying and what God had established in the nation it was Obadiah that had the fear of the Lord deep in his spirit that was part of the government system, if you will, but he would not cave and bend to the pressure. Yes. So what happens is, is Elijah shows himself to Obadiah, and Obadiah tells him, go tell, he says, go tell Ahab that, uh, you know, to meet me here, and Obadiah says, you're trying to get me killed. He said, because you got this way about you that whenever somebody sees you one place, the Spirit of the Lord just kind of carries you off someplace else. And if I go tell Ahab that you're here and the Spirit of the Lord carries you off someplace else, Ahab comes over here and doesn't find you, he's going to take it out on me. And Elijah said, I'll be here. I will meet him. Go tell him. He couldn't show himself in Ahab's court, so he had to have somebody that had access. He had to have somebody that was part recognized by, the, by that system and by that structure to go in and speak to them and let them come to find Elijah. And so I want to pick this up as Ahab meeting him. This is the first thing out of Ahab's mouth, verse 17. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 17 and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Are you the guy that makes the water boil around here? Literally, how to boil or roil the water, right? To roll it or to, uh, to heat it and cause it to, cause it to move about. So what Ahab's saying is you're the problem. That we're having problems in the nation. We have problems around here and it's all your fault. You're the one that troubles the nation. You're the one that troubles the country. It's your problem. It's your fault. You're, you're, the, uh, you're the bad guy here. But Elijah wasn't taking any guilt sandwiches today. 
He answered him and said, I've not troubled Israel. He said, oh no, I'm not the guy causing the trouble. It's you and your house. In that you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and if you and you followed Balaam. So Elijah just sets it straight. So he puts himself uh, in, in complete opposition to Ahab right off the bat. That was already a given. And Elijah's not the kind of guy that's going to go quietly into the night. He's going to stand and he's going to deliver. That's what Elijah's going to do. And so he says that Ahab tries to, tries to label him as the troublemaker. And he said, oh, this is not what's happening here. The problems that we have as a nation, the problems that we have as a country is because you've forsaken the ways of the Lord. It's not my fault. It's not the prophetic. It's not what I'm saying. It's what you're doing, how you're living, and how you're building this thing outside of the structure of what God says pleases him. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So there's 850 prophets and priests that belong to a faith that is not conducive to what Israel was built on. Okay? Elijah says they have gathered them all together. Let's settle this issue. Because if there's anything we understand here, Elijah deals with the division in the country. And if there's anything we hear on a consistent basis about where we are in our time frame, it's how deeply divided we are. Yes, that's right. When we hear these things, we need to understand something. That we're not just, we can't focus on the division. What we have to do is focus on the solution. Yes, yes. And the solution is not, it is to come together in the name of the Lord. The solution is to settle the matter and decide, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Yes, yes. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? How long are you going to... I love this word halt because it, uh, it, it implies that you're limping. That your forward motion, that your ability to advance or to, or to move forward is impeded. It is... Uh, it, it, there's a use a country term here, there's a hitch in your get along. Okay? And it means it's not smooth. It means it's not, it's not even. It means it's not, it doesn't have any uh, uh, nimbleness or any smoothness to it. Uh, uh, the, probably the best word here for that would be alacrity. It's that uh, agility and deftness and, and smoothness of motion and fluence of, of motion that, that, uh, that, the name Boaz means, and so I'll, I'll leave that where that is for right now. But, but uh, he said, "There's how long halts you between two opinions? You're staggering around here. You're limping around here. You're stumbling around because you're pulled. You guys have been uh, coerced into this this table of Jezebel. But what you need, to, what you know, is you've been born, and your your heritage is the table of the Lord, right?" And so this is, this is where you're, you're divided. And, and when people are divided in themselves, there cannot be wholeness. So the first thing you've got to do, if we're going to heal something, we've got to see people become whole on an individual basis. People have to meet a Savior. They have to have an experience that changes and makes them whole and brings them together and not be fractured or divided personally so that now... We are able to bring our wholeness to a conversation. Yes, amen. And maybe we have something to say. That being said, Elijah says, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. They didn't speak. They didn't respond. They didn't, they didn't acknowledge what he said. He knows they heard him because he's one of these fellows that's got a voice that kind of carries, I'm sure. I know people like that. And uh, 
But they didn't answer him. They didn't interact with him. They didn't. And, and, and you find that often the case with people when, we're, when they're not sure whether you're trying to trick them. You know, because, because let me say this too, all right? Because we live in, because of our, uh, our uh, ability, our, all of our inventions and devices, we have the ability to respond so fast to things that are so far away from us. We put value, we put more value as a culture on the speed with which we respond rather than the quality of the response. And that's been one of my big issues with social media is that some of you guys you just need to slow down and think about what you've got to say before you decide to say it. And you say, well, you know, you're just kind of slow to everything that way. I'd rather be, I'd rather have something worth saying and saying and say it a little later than to have to say something right in the heat of the moment and then have to fix it. Yes, that's right. It's kind of like Murphy's Law, right? Yeah. Well, then, you know, that, I'm not talking about the one we commonly know. Well, another one, Murphy had more than one law. For those of you that aren't aware of that, Murphy had more than one law. And one of his is that there's never time to do a job right the first time, but there's always time to do it over again. I think Murphy needs to adjust that law. Let's just get it done right the first time so that we don't have to do it twice, right? Anyway, but they, so they held their peace and they didn't respond to him. And so what Elijah, Elijah makes a proposition, he proposes a, unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. So he says, okay, I need you to bring us two bullocks, we're going to do a sacrifice here. And I'm even going to let your team pick first. So you're going to pick probably the better of the two bullocks. If you can find something, the one you like best is the one you're going to pick, right? So he gives them the opportunity to go first. And the whole deal is, is that the, the proposition is the God that answers by fire, this is who we're going to serve, right? So if Baal does it, then let's just roll with that. But if the Lord does it, then we need to roll with him. That's the, that's the premise, right? That's the proposal. So he says, they select a couple of bullocks, young oxen, and bring them out. And so the prophets of Baal take the one they want. And Elijah just takes what's left. And he says, and call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answers by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. We like that idea. We like that. We can go with that. We can flow with that. We can roll with that. We can agree to that. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves. Dress it first for your many and call on the name of your gods and put no fire under it. They took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. Now that word leaped is the same word translated as halt. How long halt you between two opinions earlier? I find that fascinating because they are not fluent in the way they serve, in the way they move, in the way that they approach even their God. There's something stilted, stunted in their, in their maneuvering, in their motion, in their, uh, in their walk, in what they're doing. There's something that's just a little bit off by it. Verse 27 it says, it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Elijah was not a gracious man. He was a catbird, as my grandmother used to say. I'll just leave it at that. At noon, see, they've gone from 9 o'clock in the morning until noon. They've been at this for three hours. They've been jumping up and down. They've been 
They've been shouting. They've been screeching. They've been uh, calling down fire. They've been, uh, you know, slinging blood and doing everything they know to do to get Baal's attention. And Elijah is trying to punctuate the falseness of their of what they are based on. And so as he does that, he mocks them. And he says, cry loud. In other words, can't you shout any louder? Can't you wail any, any higher? Can you, can, you not, can you not give a little more? Can you not put a little more oomph in it? For he is a God. Either he's talking... So if he's talking, you might need to talk over top of him to get his attention, right? Or he is pursuing. It's an interesting term there. It means to go somewhere in private. I heard a guy preach on this some time back, and he, he said it just kind of kind of King James code for, pardon my bluntness here, but for going to the, having to go to the bathroom. And so he was started to title his message to God of the outhouse. And so I, <laughs> you know me, I, I'm a fan of funny titles. And he's either talking or he's occupied or he's in a journey or peradventure he sleeps. He's either taking a walk. He's, he's, he's either somewhere very private where he doesn't want to be disturbed, but you need to talk louder. You need to do more. And see, this is all about what you can do, what you're supposed to do to garner favor. Their whole approach was all that they had to spend of themselves to get the attention of their God. Can I tell you that God's eye is on the righteous and his ear is open to their prayer and you and I don't necessarily have to try to get God's attention down here that we can just, we know that he already has his eye upon us. If he has his eye on the sparrow, Jesus said, are you not more important? Are you not of more value than a sparrow? Not one of these, he said, falls to the ground without your father. He said, so if you will uh, believe that, you will understand that you don't have to try to get his attention all the time. That you simply have it because you're his child. He loves you and he has a desire to interact with you. Yes, amen. Praise the Lord. Maybe he's asleep and needs to be woke up. I find it really fascinating that both in the in the realm of technology and in the and in the realm of cultural politics. Let's, that's those are Two kind of different things there. I, I, you know, heard a guy say not long ago. I haven't. I, I need to explore this a little more. But he talked about politics being downstream of culture. So, you know, when you look at some things, I, I'm not real sure where I am with that particular statement. But, but I'm, you know, I, I, I see this as being something that uh, that that is important for us to understand that. That this is a, this is for all intents and purposes, this is, there's a mixture of these things right here, right? And I, I guess what I was getting at here is either in the realm of technology or in the realm of politics and culture, which works together and flows together, the religious terminology that you encounter is, I find, I'm fascinated by it, to be quite honest, I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated that I can that I, that I have a phone that if I if I do something uh, or I want to look at something I don't have to keep it on my phone I can keep it in the cloud. I'm fascinated that 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 that's where the knowledge of everything is. It's in a cloud, not a literal cloud, but it's in what's referred to as a cloud. It's a it's a collection of of droplets of information, right? And we think of the Lord in the clouds, and we think of the, uh, of the heavens being a, a realm of clouds, right? We think of that in those terms, and I find it fascinating that these kind of terms is what's being used to convey culture. They even use the term woke as far as 
what it means to be aware of what's going on. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to wake him. It is a, it is a religious term that's been around much longer than, than uh, you know, to be awakened from sleep, uh, to, you know, uh, to awaken from slumber, rise thou that slumberest, and, uh, you know, and Christ will give thee light. Awake us, awake from your slumber, Paul said. There's this, these terms that, that, that have religious connotations to them that's being co-opted and being pulled over into a different dimension. Say, well, how do you feel about that? I'm not real sure how to feel about it right now because I think a lot of that stuff is, is misused. Cancel culture, for example, is something that is absolutely misused. But we understand cancel culture because Jesus canceled sin on the cross. Jesus took what was broken and what was wound, what what was wrong with us, and He nailed it to His tree. And at the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, everything that presented itself against us, He nailed it to the tree and took it out of the way. He canceled everything that's wrong with us. Amen. But when you take that idea and you apply it outside of Him, what you wind up with is a function that tries to cancel people for what they've done wrong. Yeah. Verse 28, he says, And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. They were just, they were absolutely desperate to make this thing work. To the place that they were self-injurious, to the place that they were that they were willing to abuse themselves. And, and, and let me tell you this, for a people that are willing to abuse themselves, they're not going to have any second thoughts about abusing you. When you're dealing with stuff like this and you're dealing with that kind of a mindset, you need to you buckle up, buttercup, because I'm telling you, there's some things out there that you need to be paying attention to. Anyway, and it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. There was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded silence from the realm of Baal, wherever that was for them. They were trying to access it and couldn't do it. There wasn't any that regarded. There wasn't any answer, no response, no anything. And Elijah said unto the people, we're getting to the meat of this right now. Elijah said to the people, come near. Now here's what you need to understand. The prophetic word of the Lord to us as people is come closer. Yes, that's right. Come closer. Now I find that fascinating. And, 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 and listen, there's a spiritual application to this. And I, and I understand that because we're in a time... We're in a season and a time where everybody wants to keep you. We, we want to stay away from everybody, right? We want to keep everybody away, but the word of the Lord is you need to come closer. Yeah. Now, you need to come closer. Now, I'm not, trying to, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to fight against social distancing here particularly. I'm telling you that there is a force in play that wants to keep people separated, yeah. that wants to keep us from assembling, that wants to keep people apart because when we come near, when we come closer, the first thing I want to say to you is, is that you need to close the distance between you and your Savior. You need to close the distance in whatever you think it is. If there's something you think you can do that's going to draw you closer to Jesus, then I suggest to you that you hear the prophetic word of the Lord today and you move closer, that you come near. Yes. Amen? That you come near unto his presence. And when you come near into his presence, then what's going to happen is something's going to start to shift inside of you. You're going to draw your attention and your focus is going to come together, right? It's going to narrow your uh, band that is, uh, has the capacity for distraction narrows. So the first thing he says is come near. I'm going to turn around and look at this for a minute. 
So I can figure out where I am here. Thank you. It all looks the same on this canvas. Elijah said unto the people, come near unto me. And the people came near unto him. And this is what I'm after. And he repaired. Hebrew term for repaired is rapha. It's the same word used in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26 where he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, Jehovah, Yahweh, Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. And so what Elijah says here is he comes and he starts to repair. He start the, It's translated as repair, but it means to mend, to cure, to heal thoroughly or to make whole. Can I tell you that what has happened culturally, what has happened is we have lost sight of what it means to walk with God. We've lost sight and maybe pulled or disconnected, if you will, from what it means to have a relationship with Christ. And what happens with that is, is in the course of that, we've not known how to respond when somebody challenges us prophetically. We've not known how to respond when, when we're in the, the, con, the greater context of everything. So you've got to draw near. You need to pull a little closer to what God's saying. And when you draw closer to that, you're going to see that there's a prophetic work. That what was sacred, what was, what was, uh, was uh, sanctified in you or that was part of your life from days gone by. That it has fallen into disrepair perhaps. Maybe it has, maybe it's been broken. Maybe you tread all over it. That's a possibility too. But can I tell you, the word of the Lord bends over and says, come near. And he bends over and he starts to repair. He starts to bring healing and bring deliverance to what was been, what has been forgotten. Yes. Or forsaken. Or irrelevant. Or of less consequence than it used to have. Find the things that you know that will draw you near and let the grace of God work in your life to draw you in to a, to a relationship where you say, if I can, I can implement that, I can get back to doing this, I can, and I'm not just talking about doing for doing's sake here. I'm talking about a response of faith. I'm talking about the, the, the grace of God working in our life so that we work with him. Not for him, but with him. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. That's the difference in performance religion and the kind that is born of grace that yet is still active and still has energy and power to move and to work and to function and flow. It's that we're not working for him, we're working with him. That we are in agreement with what God's saying. That's why you draw close. That's why you pull in near. That's why you move into a, a closer, whatever you think brings you closer. Hallelujah. Praise God. And Elijah begins to repair the altar. The altar is sometimes that sacred place that place of dedication, devotion, consecration, the things in our life that, that mattered, the things that mattered the most, the things that, that we wanted to preserve at all costs, but we've kind of, we've kind of uh, 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 walked away from them perhaps, or we've paid less attention to them in, days, uh, in, in these days than we did in days past. We need to understand that God wants to rebuild the sacred among us. That what you find sacred, that what you hold dear, that what has value and meaning in your life, that God has, that God has a word that says where he wants to rebuild that. He wants to repair the altar, the place where you can meet with him and where you find and discover his redemptive power in your life. Yeah. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. You may have been broken, but in his presence you are not broken. Hallelujah. Why? Because there's a word working in your life yes. 
There is the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. There's the glory of God working in your life to, to reconstitute some things, to, uh, to refresh and renew and redeem and restore, right? To reconcile you to a place of, uh, of, of commitment, a place of, of consecration, a place of devotion, a place of dedication, a place where you are willing to meet with God at a place where everything can be offered. He's broken down there in that last verse of the Hebrew term haras. And it means to pull down in pieces, to break or break down, to beat down, destroy or ruin. I was thinking about this in some of my extra biblical Jewish reading that uh, I have done in years past in uh, ancient Judaism. Places that were ruined were considered to be places where dark forces dwell. Okay? That's why Jesus said the when the unclean spirit is gone out of a person, where do they go? They go to the dry places, right? They go someplace that's ruined. They go someplace that's broken. They go someplace that's empty. Someplace that's not inhabited. Someplace that's that's not irrigated. Someplace that is that's something other than. And we we spend all of our time uh, trying to decode that and look at that. But when you look at it simply from the ancient Jewish perspective, all it's really saying is is when you when something gets broken down and it's not used and it's pulled in pieces. That's where you have the opportunity for darkness to begin to have a steady influence in the way you think, in the way you live, in the way you move, and in the way you have your being. But can I tell you that Jesus came and the prophetic says the word of the Lord to, to his church and his people is, is that come near because I'm going to repair what's broken. I'm going to make it a habitation, not a drag edge. But I'm going to make it a habitation of righteousness. I'm going to make it a place of holiness, a place of sanctity, a place of consecration, a place of dedication and devotion. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Take a minute and get my breath there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, what has been broken down, Elijah starts to repair. And here's how he starts. He took 12 stones. According to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came. See, unto whom the word of the Lord came. Unto whom God spoke, prophesied to him. You're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel. I'm calling you Israel. I'm telling you that as a prince, you have power with God. You're not a heel catcher anymore. I'm moving you into a new dimension. I'm moving you into a new way of thinking, a new way of life, a new way to live, a new way to perceive and understand my work in your life. Yes. Hallelujah. And Elijah took 12 stones and he put them together in a, in a way that then uh, he could lay the wood on top of it in order, right? So can I tell you that Elijah had to remember what had power, what had meaning and substance, what had value not just to him, but to them as a nation. He took their identity that was God-given and he reminded them in the stone. He reminded them in those 12 stones. He reminded them who they were. He reminded them the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. He said, this is your God. I'm building back what has been destroyed by this direction that has, that has taken place in this, in this nation. He said, and I'm building it back. I'm building it stone by stone. I'm laying it together and I'm placing it in a way that can be solid Hallelujah. and secure. Hallelujah. That can 
move you into a dimension of freedom and light and grace. Hallelujah. Looking at the wrong thing there. He took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying Israel shall be thy name. Israel's your name. And so everybody that drew near was being reminded of all the things that had been built in their life. To understand they've gone from they've gone from Abraham to Moses to Joshua to Judges to Saul, to David, and now they're in the descending lines of kings and the kingdom split and divided and, and, and had kind of torn itself apart because they thought the kingdom was going to fix their ups and downs like they had with the judges, right? But can I tell you, the kingdom of men cannot fix those things because it's still a kingdom of men. That's why I tell people that the kingdom of God needs to be something that rises up in your house. And in my house, it does not come to us through the White House. It does not come to us through a chamber or a house of delegates or a house of representatives. It comes to you and I by being the house and temple of the Lord. Amen. And so they began to remember those things. And, the, and that's what... God does in our life when we start to stray, when we start to wander off, when we are, I think the, the, the New Testament term is uh, to be seduced. See, we think of that only in a literal aspect. But it's more of a spiritual problem than a physical problem. But if I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you don't deal with it from a spiritual vantage point, it will, can affect you physically. And I think that speaks volumes as to some of the things churches have endured and survived. Can I tell you that's why, that's why the word of the Lord is, is you may have been broken, but you are not broken. Yes, hallelujah. You have endured a great fight of afflictions, Paul talks about. But you have endured them, and it's been a breaking. It's been, a, it's been a, a, an uneasy and a painful and, and, and a process that has been difficult to say the least. But God is saying, I'm building something now that you are going to find a, a restoration of all that has been true of you, of all that I have ever said to you, of all the blessing I ever spoke over the house of Israel. I speak it over you. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar. So my best guess, and this is a just a calculated guess. The altar has four corners representing the four corners of the earth, right? And so on each of those four corners would be three stones that would be stock and that you could make as pillars. And on those stones, then you put the wooden framework that puts together what you need to lay the pieces of your bullock on so that you can then, so that typically you would light the fire under it, it would burn up, and that would be how that works. But because they're laying it all out but not lighting the fire, it's got to be the God that answers by fire, right? Yeah. So, so that, that's in my estimation because he not only does that, he with the stones he built an altar and he made a trench about the altar as as great as would contain two measures of seed. So, so this, this ditch that he dug around was there to hold water. And he put the wood in order. I love that. He put the wood in order. Not only did he take time to lay the stone, not only did he take time to repair the altar that was broken down, to remind them with each stone. I, I would venture to say that with each stone he recited the name of a tribe. Each stone that he put down, he named a tribe as he said it. And so those who came near could hear what he was saying. And as he laid the wood, he began to speak 
probably by the blessing of Abraham as Abraham and Isaac carried the wood to the altar of Moriah and he reminded them again of their heritage of faith and he reminded them again that God, hey, he speaks and he draws us to a place of sacrifice where he can show us his glory, where he can show us his goodness, where he can show us his purpose and his plan and that becomes this picture in this altar and as he does this he lays the sacrifice on it and he does the craziest thing here <laughs> one of the things I failed to mention in the background part of this message is that they were in a famine yes, yes. is that the Israel was in a famine and they were trying to figure out how to get out of it, trying to figure out how to make it in. Now, if you were part of the, if you were part of that government of the of Ahab and Jezebel, you were going to lay all your money on if I can kill Elijah, we can get the famine to end. But Elijah shows up and he says, This is not about me. It's about you and the fact what you've walked away from and what you've left and where you have carried this people into this place of dearth and this place of famine. He said, but what you need to understand is is we're going to find out who's, who we're going to serve here. We're going to find out which direction we're going to go. We're going to find this out today. And when we find this out, it's going to change everything. Yes, amen. And here's what you need to rem remember and realize. It doesn't take the king away. Because Ahab doesn't get unseated here. When all this settles, the first, the only thing that Elijah says to him, and if I were, if I were pushing the prophets of Baal, and I watched Elijah and the people rise up and kill 450 of them, I would probably think there's a good possibility I could be next. Right? I mean, maybe my mind works different than everybody else's, but I don't think so. But when this finishes, what, Ahab, what Elijah says to Ahab is, go home, because it's fixing to rain, and you don't want to get caught out in this rain. We're ending the dearth, we're ending the drought, we're ending the end of this difficult period. Can I tell you that what's happened in 2020 is we've had some folks that have started to lay again the foundations of the altar of the Lord. Can I tell you that we started building something redemptive in the earth. We've started to remember what God has set to be true for you and I redemptively in regard to our salvation, in regard to his grace. And we are now working in agreement with that and building something so that what God is going to do is bring an end to this mess. Yes, amen. He put the wood in order. I love that. Some of us don't want to have any kind of order. But you got to have some kind of order or your structure has no, it's hard to read. <laughs> It's, it does. It, it's hard to figure out. It's like modern art. <laughs> or abstract art or something like that. Something that's, you know, the lines are different. And now look, if you're a fan of those things, I'm, you know, that, that's, I'm okay with that. But not everybody's a fan of that. Most everybody likes the more classic stuff, right? I'm not saying everybody has to like that. I'm just saying that that's a, that's, that's, Take some getting used to. It's, I believe the cultural term is an acquired taste. Anyway, but he puts the wood in order and cuts the bullock in pieces and he lays him on the wood. And in a famine, he says, fill me a barrel of water and dump it on there. Now look, it's a famine. Water's pretty scarce. So that's a pretty bold maneuver, right? And he didn't stutter, but he said it again. So in a famine, he not only calls for a, for a barrel of water to be dumped all over his wood, all over his uh, a bullock, and all over to where it runs on the ground and starts to puddle in the trench. 
He has him bring a second barrel, and then he has him bring a third. Oh, the extravagance of this minister. Can you figure what the headline would be in our day today? When so many are when so many are 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 without and, and he's throwing stuff away, right? He's just kind of treating it like it's uh, casual for him. Yes. I'm not saying that's great behavior. I'm saying that what's happening here is prophetic. Yes. What he's saying is, is there's abundance of rain coming because this sacrifice is going to be met by the God that answers by fire. And the water I'm putting down here, he's going to lick it up. When it goes up, it's going to pour out. That what's in the heavens is going to come down and nourish the earth. And I thought it's based on this redemptive thing God's doing. It's based on the rebuilding of what's been broken. It's based on repairing that that's been broken and torn down and rent in pieces. It's been trodden underfoot. Verse 34 says, and he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. So much water that the ditch couldn't hold it all. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So he gave them three hours to get their stuff done from from 9 a.m. till noon, right, midday. And then he started in at noon, and it's taken him three hours. Can I tell you what God does? He's not in a hurry to get done. He just wants to get it done. He wants to do it right. He wants to make sure that what he builds along the way is understood and received and seen by the people so that they have the right imagery, so that they have the right idea, so that they have the right concept to move forward. So at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and, is and of Israel. Usually it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? But he's already told them. This is, you know, this is when God spoke to, called his name Israel. Then Elijah uses that term because he said we're not going, we're not going all the way back to that old identity. We're coming into what God says is true of you. Your descendants of the prince that has power. You are descending the descending line of what God said was true of him when he when he changed him from being the heel catcher and the supplanter. And he he allowed, he wrestled with him through the night and through that wrestling. Uh, the way Jacob walked changed and he became a prince. And it changed and showed in the way that he lived after that, right? And so he calls on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I'm thy servant and that I've done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Now, that's one of the hallmarks of the ministry of Elijah that's prophesied in regard to the, to the Messiah, right? Is that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children right. and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Yeah, okay? And so, so he's talking here about a turning of the heart. And so he's, the children are returning to the fatherhood of God. The children here are returning to the idea that God is for them, that God is over them, that God is the author of their existence, and he's the one they need to look to. He's the, he's the one they seek direction from. He's the one that gives meaning. He's the one that fills with purpose. He's the one that allows us to find our way in uncertain days and uncertain times. He's light for our darkness. He's strength for our weakness. Hey, God is good. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. And so in this, he makes the statement, they've turned their, they've, you've turned their heart back and then the fire of the Lord fell. Woo. I'm telling you, God answered by fire. Hallelujah. And when he did, the fire came so fast and so hot, consumed the burnt sacrifice. That's pretty... 
That's pretty impressive. That's what the burnt offering was. It was to be consumed and burnt up, right? And the wood and the stones, he even destroyed the stones, right? I mean, just, just this, the power of God, so, so majestic and so prominent, so on display as to be undeniable in that audience. Consume the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust. And I love this, and licked up the water that was in the trench. That's a thirsty fire. <laughs> that is one thirsty fire, folks. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the, he is the God. The, the Lord, he is the God. He's the God. Balaam is not the God. We have discovered this today. It has been, we really knew it all along, but now we have been reminded. Now we remember. Now what has been broken has been repaired. So can I submit to you that it wasn't about the altar literally and physically. It was about what was in them to understand the nature of relationship with God. And that's what Elijah rebuilt. And it changed because God consumed everything Elijah built. But he consumed it so that the sacred place, so that the place of dedication would flow out of the temple that he had designs on, Hallelujah. which was the people. God. Licked up the water that was in the trench, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And Elijah said unto them, what happens here is, is that if you're not paying attention, you get so overwhelmed in the goodness of God in the moment that what you've been fighting will tuck tail and go somewhere else, find another place of ruins to hide in, grow, multiply, build back up, and then go ahead and fight that same enemy again. Man, I could say so many things about that right now, but I've been talking too long as it is. You wonder why some things don't go away? Can't help myself. <laughs> you wonder why some things that have failed for so long haven't just gone away? Because they retreat to a place that's broken. They retreat to a place that's ignorant. They retreat to another place. And what they do is they multiply and they represent themselves in a different thing. myself down just a minute. I'm trying to figure out where I am here. So Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. They took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, or Kishon I should say, and slew them there. All of those things that had grown under the influence and power of what was false, of what was untrue, of what would lead you into captivity and what would lead you astray. All of those things have to go. And they need to be, you need to find the end of those things. And you can find them on the cross of Calvary. You can find those things. You can put them to an end. You can remind yourself that those things have no place in your life. You can remind yourself by, by simply remembering that place of sacrifice, by remembering that great altar of altars called Calvary, the place where Jesus bled and died, and the place where he gave his life for you and me, the place where if we need to recalibrate, we need to come back to that place and remember it. That's why he said, you know, the, to break the bread and to drink the cup, do this in remembrance of me. Because if you can remember this, it's going to carry you until you see him appear in all of his glory in your life. Yes, amen. amen. So they eliminate them. By the way, the, the, the brook or the river, the Kishon, is mentioned, I think, three or four times in the book of Judges, just as kind of a bit of a sidebar there. You remember a guy named Sisera. Now, when Deborah was judge, and, and Barak was one of the, the uh, uh, judges, that, the, the military commander at the time, 
You remember this story? Because I've, <laughs> I've preached on it before, and I think I preached on it here. It's called Yael and a Nail. It's Sisera from the brook, from this river, who comes in and he hides in Yael's tent. We would say Jael, but in Hebrew it's Yael. He hides in her tent, and she drives a tent peg through his skull while he's asleep, right? She puts the hammer to him. Hallelujah. But that's that's where this is where they caught the prophets of Baal. I find that to be fascinating that that the, where they had been attacked from an enemy before it kind of goes in and uh, kind of along the, the lines of what I said just a few minutes ago about about things tend to skitter around into the dark, find another place that's broken and ruined that nobody has the interest in so it can rebuild itself, rename itself, rebrand itself, and represent itself in a, with a little bit of a variation so people think it's different. It's not what, it, what, it's, not what it's always been. Anyway, so they take him down to that brook and they, they slayed him there. The people helped him. Elijah didn't do all that by himself. They eliminated out of their life those things. And Elijah said unto Ahab, he didn't say, your kingdom's done, you're out of power, you're, you're, no, you're no longer king here. He said, get up and eat and drink. Or go grab you something to eat. This is something to drink. But there's a sound of the abundance of rain, the famine's over. The, th the, 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 the land's been reset. God's made his point here. And so now where what has caused the famine has been our reckless approach to, to walking a different way and, and being seduced and being led astray by this, by this government, if you will. And now what's happened is, as Elijah said, God answered by fire. Now we've recalibrated. We've reset the table. I'm telling you, God's going to bless the land because when God's the focal point, the land is blessed. God's, when God's the focal point, that's why you can't worry about how, what, how elections turn out. You, gotta, you have to make sure that your land is calibrated and your heart is situated in a place where your land is going to be blessed. You may have been broken, but you are not broken. You have been repaired. He is the Lord that he with thee. Yes, what has been broken in our life can be revived, Hallelujah. rebuilt, restored, repaired. So right now, we're just going to have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you today. Thank you. And I bless you. And I ask you, Father God, right now, that Lord, you would let this word sink richly and deeply into the ears and the hearts of your people today. That everything, Lord God, that, Father, we may have looked at that we fear and feel like might be uh, out of kilter and out of sorts with us, Father, may we, may we draw near to you today, as, as Elijah said, and may we, may we humble ourselves. May we be willing to bend down, stoop down in grace and and. And remember the covenant and remember the life of Christ and remember all that you have done, all that you have spoken, everything that you have said that's true of us. May we build that place and may we see, Father God, that, sancti that, that sanctuary and that particular place of, of dedication and devotion, Lord God, may it be rebuilt in our lives and may we, may we find our way forward and, Lord, we pray. For the sound of the abundance of rain. Lord God, as we recalibrate, as we see what's broken, be repaired, restored, and redeemed. Father God, we thank you for that. And we honor you in the name of Jesus. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. And Father God, we, we just say, Lord, you're going to rain on our land. And you're going to rain, pour out blessings that we cannot consume. You, Father God, are going to uh, are going to uh, provide every need and every uh, lead and guide us in every aspect, in every sense of direction and purpose. And, and Father God, I thank you for that, and I bless you in the name of Jesus. 
In the name of Jesus, Lord, I give you glory and I give you honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Bless your name, Lord God.